You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Deadly blast rips through crowded Kabul mosques, several killed. Targeted killings of minorities in Kashmir evoke anger and outrage. And FATF set to verify Pakistan for money laundering during on-site visit. Let's begin the show with Afghanistan, a country which has long been a base for terrorists with ambitions for global jihad. Dozens of groups that have been present since the Taliban's last turn in power are again operational. A series of bomb blasts conducted by the Islamic State terror groups have increased the concerns for residents in the war-torn country. Recently, a huge explosion ripped through a crowded mosque in the Afghan capital, Kabul, killing at least 20 people. A report. A massive explosion ripped through a mosque in Afghanistan's Kabul, left at least 20 dead. The blast which took place during the evening prayers was so powerful that it shattered windows in nearby buildings. A top Islamic Shia cleric, Amir Muhammad Kabuli, was also killed in the attack. The incident took place on a week that marks one year of the Taliban taking control of Afghanistan. People could be seen gathered outside the hospital and the relatives were waiting for news of their family members who were being treated inside for injuries caused by the attack. 30% of the, of the admitted patients are in, in severe condition, in serious condition, and they've underwent uh, uh, major surgery. So vascular explorations, vascular repairs, uh, and uh, intra-abdominal injury uh, repairs and management. So this is something that is demanding quite a lot of time, resources, and expertise to let's say, minimize the possibility of complications and reduce the, the mortality. The blast came a week after a senior Taliban cleric known for his fiery speeches against the Islamic State was killed at his madrasa in Kabul in a suicide bomb blast, which was claimed by the jihadist group. Islamic State has emerged as the most important enemy of the Taliban who seized control over Afghanistan last year. The two groups are now engaged in a murky and bloody battle. On one hand, situation in Afghanistan is deteriorating day by day. On the other hand, Taliban are celebrating their achievement. Recently, to mark a year in power, many Taliban members fired celebratory gunshots in the air in Kabul and waved the group's black and white flag. A few hundred people, including supporters, soldiers and officials, gathered at the square in front of the US Embassy to mark the day. In a ceremony attended by Taliban government ministers, acting Foreign Minister Amir Khan Muttaki claimed that their rule had brought security. افغانستان په تیرو څلوېښتو پنځوسو کلونو کې په لومړي ځل افغانستان د افغانانو کور شو هغه داسې چې په تیرو رژیمونو کې هیڅ داسې کس په افغانستان کې ګزاره نه شوی کولی چې هغه نظام سره به جوړ نه The future is immensely weak for Afghans if more is not done by the international community to ensure the Taliban changes its modus operandi and complies with its human rights obligations.
The recent targeted killings of members of religious minorities in Kashmir have created widespread fear among Kashmiri-speaking Hindus. Many Hindu families chose to stay when the majority of the Kashmiri pundits fled for safety to Jammu and other places in 1990 when armed insurgency was at its peak in the valley. The recent target killings of minorities are giving a frightening reminder of the early years of the conflict when such incidents were common. Take a look. The spectre of 1990s is back again to haunt the valley with the targeted killings of Hindu minority. Kashmir has been witnessing a series of targeted killings since October last year. In October, seven civilians were killed in five days. The latest targeted killing of a Kashmiri pundit by terrorists in South Kashmir's Shopian district has sparked a fresh wave of fears among the minority community members in the valley, who feel increasingly scared and insecure. Sunil Kumar Nath and his brother Pintu Kumar were shot at by motorcycle born terrorists when they were working in the orchard in Chotigam village of Shopia. While Nath died on the spot, Kumar is in hospital with critical bullet wounds. कल वाले केस में हम लोग पहचान कर चुके हैं कि उस केस में कौन इन्वॉल्व है कौन दो लोग आए थे जिन्होंने इसका कत्ल किया उसका पता चल गया है और उसके लिए बराबर कार्रवाई जारी है फॉलो अप एक्शन जारी है सख्त दंड दिया जाएगा देयर हैज बीन एन इंक्रीज इन द नंबर ऑफ इंसिडेंट्स ऑफ टारगेटेड एसेसिनेशंस ऑफ कश्मीरी हिंदूस पाकिस्तान बैक टेररिस्ट हैव शिफ्टेड देयर टैक्टिक्स आउट ऑफ फ्रस्ट्रेशन and now are targeting unarmed police personnel and innocent civilians from the minority community. Pakistan is making a desperate effort to instill dread and terror among the people in an effort to impede the region's economic development and advancement. Experts believe that Islamabad is deliberately enticing terrorists into the Kashmir Valley with an aim to keep the region on the boil. Anger is sweeping through the Kashmir Valley, where hundreds of Kashmiri pundits, mournful and dry, held a massive protest against the killing of their community member, shouted anti-terrorist slogans and demanded justice. It comes at a time when Pakistan, in spite of staring at imminent bankruptcy, has still not been removed from the FATF grey list. Pakistan has left no stone unturned to create mayhem in India, whether be it supporting the militancy in Jammu and Kashmir or militancy in Punjab. They, at the smallest opportunity, try to create mayhem in India and leave no stone unturned to bleed India. Kashmiris have understood that terrorism and separatism cannot flourish in Jammu and Kashmir. For Pakistan, which has been attempting to internationalize the Kashmir issue for more than seven decades, this is the worst suffering. The notorious intelligence agency of Pakistan, ISI, aims to reawaken the fear of being killed in the minds of ordinary Kashmiris. In Kashmir, being a member of a minority group is sufficient to be killed. Kill one and scare a thousand is Pakistan's motto. That is how they were able to chase out the whole community of Kashmiri Pandits from their roots that had been ingrained in the valley soil for centuries. However, such heinous terrorist activities will not be able to undermine the advancement of Jammu and Kashmir. The one-year anniversary of the Taliban not only marked the groups taking over Afghanistan, but also the restrictions on women's rights and freedom of expression in the Afghan state. In the most recent incident, Taliban fighters violently dispersed a rear assembly in the Afghan capital while beating Afghan women demonstrators and firing into the air. About 40 female protesters marched in front of the Afghan Ministry of Education, calling for work, freedom and bread. A report. In a rare sight on the streets of Kabul, several dozen women protested against the Taliban rule. 
and chanted slogans justice justice we are fed up with ignorance marching in front of afghanistan's education ministry they demanded bread work and freedom but their protest was violently interrupted by the taliban members firing into the air the women run for safety in the nearby shops where they were chased and bitten by the taliban with their rifle butts he shoot on us they shoot on us the protest came just two days before the taliban marked its first year in power نگرانی ما خیلی زیاد است از هر نظر که ببینیم ما زیر فشار هستیم نگرانی ما خیلی زیاد به درس خود ادامه داده نمیتونیم اگر به درس خود ادامه هم داده بتونیم میگن این قسم باشین این قسم باشین بسیار نگرانی ما زیاد است زودتر از کدام شما بگیم Taliban overthrew the elected government of Afghanistan last August established a stone age regime with barbaric laws and reverse centuries of women's achievement they imposed a primitive government with brutal rules and undid centuries of progress for women the hardliners deprived millions of women of their right to education ousted tens of thousands of women from government jobs and banned their businesses and all sorts of activism today they have plunged afghan women into the dark ages again and women in the country have even lost the right to life in march the taliban went back on their promise to allow girls to attend high schools claiming they would remain closed until a plan was developed that would allow them to reopen in conformity with islamic law afghan women have also been banned from traveling alone and can only visit public gardens and parks in the capital on days separate from men in may this year the country's supreme leader and chief of the taliban hibatullah akhunzada even ordered women to fully cover themselves in public including their faces ideally with an all encompassing burqa at first a few afghan ladies protested modestly by pushing back against the limits however the taliban quickly apprehended the ring leaders incarcerated them without charge and kept them under house arrest خب ایجاب اسلامی هم نظر ایجاب تمام بدن که از به اتفاق علما فرض است بالای زنا اما ایجاب بر روی کسی مسئله اتفاقی اتفاقی نیست اختلافی است که نظر ای برمیگرده به عرف و عادات مردم که چه قسم عرف و عادات مردم است اگر فتنه به اوجش رسیده بود درست است ایجاب بر روی هم فرض میشه اگر فتنه نبود ما آزار اذیت نمیشدند دخترا ایجاب بر روی فرض نیست هر کس به دلخواه خود می A century ago, the women in Afghanistan were free. They enjoyed the right to education, right to political participation, and the right to movement. Even in the 1970s, in Kabul's universities, women made up more than 60% of students, and they were equally represented in several public institutions. Under the Taliban rule the rights of women and girls have worsened. Additionally Afghanistan is in the midst of a severe humanitarian and economic catastrophe where previously there was hope with women having a key role in society there is now starvation destitution and violence it is so difficult to imagine how much has changed for so many in such a short period of time Afghan women are repeatedly urging the international community to step in and support the women in war torn country
For several years, Islamabad has been supportive to terrorist groups despite several stern warnings from the international community. The government of Pakistan has been accused of aiding terrorist organizations operating on this soil who have attacked neighboring India and other countries. Global Money Laundering and Terrorism Watchdog Financial Action Task Force is due for on-site visit to Pakistan next month to verify steps taken by the country to exit the watchdog's grey list. Pakistan's active participation in terrorism has caused thousands of deaths in the region. For several years, Islamabad has been supportive to terrorist groups despite several stern warnings from the international community. The government of Pakistan has been accused of aiding terrorist organizations operating on their soil who have attacked neighboring India and other countries. On several occasions, arrested terrorists in Kashmir and other parts of India have revealed that money for jihad is transferred to terror organization via Pakistan Army and its notorious intelligence agency, the ISI. Moreover, many terror organizations in the country change names and set up other groups to frame that Pakistan is looking into it. In the past, several global organizations have warned Islamabad of unfavorable consequences as it never paid heed to their suggestions. Global Money Laundering and Terrorism Watchdog Financial Action Task Force is due for on-site visit to Pakistan next month to verify steps taken by the country to exit the watchdog's grey list. The terrorism is running all the camps of the army. The financing is running all the army. The proxy war is running all the army. So the army goes to credit that Pakistan is in the grey list. When it was in the grey list, why was it the government of the Nawaz Sharif? FATF on June 17 said that Pakistan will continue to stay on its grey list and a final decision to remove it from the list will be taken after an on-site verification visit by the Paris-based body. Ahead of the all-important visit, Pakistan is finalising its strategy and holding consultations with all the relevant authorities. According to a Pakistani media outlet's sources last week, a crucial meeting chaired by Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, Hina Rabani Khar, was convened at the Foreign Office for this purpose. Marx player President FATF has said that Pakistan has done on paper all of these work, but now we to see that Pakistan has to go to Terrorists need money and other assets for weapons but also training, travel and accommodation to plan and execute their attacks and develop as an organization. Disrupting and preventing these terrorism-related financial flows and transactions is one of the most effective ways to fight terrorism. Not only can it prevent future attacks by disrupting their material support, the footprints of these purchases, withdrawals and other financial transactions can provide valuable information for ongoing investigations. Pakistan has so far avoided being on the blacklist with the help of close allies like China, Turkey and Malaysia. Hence, the world community must address contradictions in the war on terror. For 20 years, the world has failed to agree on a common definition of terrorism at the United Nations. Unless the world is truly united on the issue and resolves such contradictions, the global war on terror will only be as strong as its weakest link. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Hina Joshi signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. Number one multicultural channel. This is Tag TV.